The Lion Man of Holenstein Straddle was found in 1931 in Germany. It is a delicate figurine made from mammoth ivory and dated to about 38,000 years ago. It features the head of a lion on a human body and is one of the oldest known zoomorphic or animal shaped sculptures in the world. This Sumerian figurine is about 5,000 years old and is also part human and part lion. This one considered by most to be a lioness. It was discovered near Baghdad and sold to a private collection for just over $57 million in 2007. Sculptures of unions of different elements into one symbol were common to the ancient Mesopotamians, Egyptians, and Greeks. The image of the Sphinx depicted the body of a lion and the head of a human, while the harpies of Greek mythology showed bird-like human women. This is called a Lamassu. The word was used by the Assyrian and Akkadians based on the earlier Sumerian word Lama, which was the goddess of protection. She was also the goddess of intercession, which means to intervene on behalf of another. So she acted as an intermediary between the Sumerians and the gods. The ancient Mesopotamians typically prominently placed the Lamassu at the entrances of cities and palaces and from the front they appear to stand, but from the side, walk. This is the world famous Louvre Museum in Paris, France. Let's take a look inside, shall we? Although the Louvre carries some fine examples of Sumerian art featuring beautiful Lamassu statues, they are just replicas. To see the real thing these days, one must go to Berlin. This is the Pergamon Museum in Germany, and now that we are in the presence of some authentic Lamassus, Let's take a closer look and inspect the statue's symbology. The ox representing Taurus, the lion representing Leo, the eagle representing Scorpio, and the man or angel representing Aquarius. In Western astrology, the four symbols are associated with the elements of earth, fire, water, and air, respectively. The same way that our solar year was divided into 12 parts, we call months, the ancients knew of another cycle which Plato called the Great Year, which lasted roughly 25,000 years and was also divided into 12 parts or astrological ages, lasting about 2,150 years each which is also referred to as a great month or processional age. The term great year is defined by NASA as, and I quote, the period of one complete cycle of the equinoxes around the ecliptic. In other words, the time it takes for the sun to travel through each of the 12 houses of the zodiac, which is called the procession of the equinox, and to learn about why this happens, please refer to my video presentation on astrotheology. And that's a word which simply means the celestial or astrological influence on religion. For now, I'd like to draw your attention to these four astrological symbols, which incidentally are represented in ancient Egyptian culture as canopic jars they were intended as containers for the internal organs removed from mummies, but also represent these same four signs. Richard Hinckley Allen explains in his 1899 book, In Star Names and Their Meanings, 
that the Great Sphinx of Giza was constructed, and I quote, with Virgo's head on Leo's body from the fact that the sun passes through these two constellations during the inundation of the Nile. So the Great Sphinx aligns perfectly towards Cardinal East reflecting the significance of the four cardinal directions in the Old Kingdom. During the process of mummifications, four organs were placed by the ancient Egyptians in special containers and these jars were personified by the four different gods known as the Sons of Horus associated with these same cardinal signs. So what is it with these specific four signs, four fixed signs. Why are they so important? These same four signs are regarded in Christianity as the four living creatures of the prophet Ezekiel. They're also found biblically as the four evangelists and the four beasts of revelation. So what I'm asking you is why these four signs? Why not some other signs? Well, to try and solve this riddle, let's first reflect on some statements made by two very famous men in the occult to see if we can gain some insight or at least some better context before we proceed. In his book, Morals and Dogma, the 33rd degree Freemason, Albert Pike said, and I quote, Masonry, like all religions, all the mysteries, Hermeticism and alchemy conceals its secrets to all except the adept and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it." End quote. In his book the secret teachings of all ages. Honorary 33rd degree Freemason, Manley P. Hall says, and I quote, Symbols may both reveal and conceal. For to the wise, the subject of symbols is obvious, while to the ignorant, the figure remains inscrutable. Hence, he who seeks to unveil the secret doctrine of antiquity must search for that doctrine not upon the pages of books which might fall onto the hands of the unworthy, but in the place where it was originally concealed." End quote. In other words, there is a lot of room for error and misinterpretation when symbols are not properly understood, especially when the true meaning is purposely concealed. That said, many Christians or people who consider themselves biblical experts all around the world today interpret the Bible as saying that the earth is only 6,000 years old. And while many of my former anthropology professors got a kick out of mm, basically making fun of the people who subscribe to that, they themselves interpreted the Bible as stating the same thing. So even though they didn't believe it, they still thought they are still ignorant to the actual intended meaning. So let us once again review the solar year, which can be divided into four parts with two solstices, one the longest day of the year at summer and one at the opposite time of the year when the night is the longest at the winter solstice at around Christmas time. So. There are two points called equinoxes and those are when the length of the day is equal. And this comes also comes down to us as familiar holidays. So if we do the same thing and apply these four points over the great year, which is roughly 25,000 years long, we get four sections with points represented by zodiac constellations or astrological ages that cover a little over 2,000 years each. And so each of the four sections would be a bit over 6,000 years each. Now these four signs are fixed and by that I mean there is an exact astronomical date of when, of when 
these four signs were the four cardinal points because they're always changing. You know, for example, now as I'm posting this video, the four cardinal signs of the zodiac are Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. So to reiterate my question, when are the cardinal signs Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius? To unlock the secret to this mystery, we must once again turn to the occult, a word which literally means secret. And we find out that what the Bible was referring to 6,000 years ago was the start of an age, not the start of the world or the start of all of life or some other hasty or unsophisticated interpretation. And the more one looks into this, the clearer this becomes. The swastika is probably the most ancient emblem of the solar year, as well as Plato's great year. The legendary Aryans were, philosophically speaking, a solar race, their most sacred sign being the swastika, the best known of all solar symbols, and Aries, while being venerated as a war god, was also regarded as a solar deity in the astrotheological context, and the age of Aries was around 2000 BC, which is why expansions at that time into India by the sun-worshipping, horse-riding, swastika-carrying, blonde and blue-eyed Aryans, they were famous for their horses, and there are no horses or chariots in India's fossil record until these Aryans introduced them to the subcontinent as they also introduced Sanskrit itself to India. As I said, the Aryans entered India during the Holocene from the north and we find evidence of this etched in stone thousands of years ago in Iran. From the inscription at the tomb of Darius the Great, and I quote, I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings, the king of many countries and many people, the king of this expansive land, Persian, the son of a Persian, Aryan, from the Aryan race, end quote. Now, no matter how hard one tries, you will not find the word Indo-European anywhere. And that's because it does not exist in reality. It exists in the politically correct minds of social engineers at the United Nations. But what is etched in stone is the word Aryan. So to some degree in India, there still remains this ethnic caste system that was imposed on them by the Aryans who were regarded as the nobility. Even though the word does not mean nobility, as I just explained, it comes from the age of Aries. So let's see how this bears out. I'd like you to listen to this short introduction from the original Conan the Barbarian movie. And in light of what we just went over, you may or may not have heard this before, but let's see if it makes sense to you. See if you can figure out the time period that the narrator tries to set the stage for. Uh, he doesn't give you any numerical dates, so pay attention. And in the comment section, I'd like you to please tell me when, when this movie takes place based on what you're about to hear. So listen closely. So he said, between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis, which according to yours truly is at the end of the Pleistocene age and the start of the Holocene age. It's a very important time, geologically speaking. There were rapidly melting ice caps, rising sea levels, mass extinctions, etc. 
he also says, and the rise of the sons of Arius. It was an age undreamed of. So the sons of Arius are the Arians and their rise was when? That's the question. And if you can answer it, many mysteries will unravel, especially the ones that many have tried to hide. The same era that saw the introduction of the horse to India was the same as when the horse was introduced to Egypt via the Middle East by the Hyksos, which to the Egyptians meant foreign rulers. The ancient Egyptians hated them. And when they had their civil war and expelled the Hyksos, which comes down to us as the Exodus story in the Bible, the Egyptians removed their names from every single stone in Egypt, which is why nobody seems to know who they were. They actually chiseled away every single reference to this dynasty. Ironically, their lineage are now the most famous of the pharaohs because their tombs were so well hidden and that's why we know about them. These quote-unquote Aryans that entered India, uh, they also entered Egypt around the same time, but unlike India, they were expelled after a couple of centuries. And this same blue-eyed statues that we see in Mesopotamia, they're mirrored in the blue-eyed statues of ancient Egyptian pharaohs, all of which predate Alexander the Great and have absolutely nothing to do with his Macedonian uh, Ptolemy line. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an author and anthropologist and would like to invite you to join me in awakening from a long amnesia. Species with amnesia, our forgotten history, Gods with amnesia, subterranean worlds of inner earth, the occult secrets of Vril, and 1666, redemption through sin. I would like to thank my subscribers who share my posts as I rely on word of mouth. And I appreciate all of the positive feedback, reviews on my books, and I thank you very much for listening.